So from then on, whenever we were putting pedals, we called her a speed. And then we put an asterisk where we put, you know, uh, that glasses or, you know, not a derogatory way. Maybe. And it was that, that was cool. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's, it's another Keith Explains Day. We, I was just talking about my time in student government. Someday I'll talk about student government because student government was hilarious for me. It's, student government's what got me through college. Well, that and caffeine because I drank a lot of caffeine in, in college. Not, not really until my second year when I started going to the IHOP late at night because I had this linguistics class in the morning with my friend Jason. And in linguistics class, you have to memorize lots of stuff, like all these weird diphthongs and how to write them and everything else. And it, we were not able to get linguistics class down in the normal fashion, which is I'd try and stare at the papers and I wouldn't memorize it. So eventually Jason's like, we should study together. And I'm like, okay. He's like, let's meet at the IHOP at 11 at night. And I don't know why 11. I mean, I was often up at 11 at night, but we met at the IHOP at 11 at night. And we sat down and we ordered the pot of coffee because pot of coffee was like a buck seventy-five at, at IHOP then, and it was as much as you could drink. They keep bringing you pot, you know, big pots of coffee, and so we'd go to the IHOP and we'd start studying linguistics and we'd study linguistics all night long. And and we'd drink the coffee and maybe we'd get some French fries or something as food wise, and we'd study the linguistics and eventually we got through linguistics, which. It was way more effort than, it was like a 100 level class or something. It was very, very low level. I don't remember why we put that much effort into linguistics, but we were sophomores, so we didn't know that this was dumb. Um, and, and I think the reason Jason chose IHOP is that IHOP had a cute waitress who, who would bring the coffee by and Jason would flirt with her up, up until Jason learned that the cute waitress had a boyfriend. And then she'd start to talk to us about her boyfriend and that, that was very disturbing to Jason for a while because her boyfriend wasn't the greatest guy and then she'd start telling us weird stuff she and her boyfriend did and that was just kind of creepy to me and especially to Jason and, and then she broke up with her boyfriend so then Jason tried but we're studying linguistics this whole time like we'd meet like two or three nights a week and study linguistics to get through this stupid class but that, that has nothing to do with, with the topic for tonight. I, I just got onto that because I was talking about that before we started. We, we also were talking about bubonic plague earlier. I'm going to try not to talk about that either because there's lots of stuff to talk about. Now, it's, for me, it's January. I mean, by the time you'll see this, it's probably March. But for me, it's, it's the end of the holiday season. And by the end of the holiday season, you know, it's, holidays are over. From now on, it's, you know, it's a long slog pretty much into to Independence Day with precious few holidays between here and then. There's Valentine's Day. But Valentine's Day isn't a holiday for guys. It's a holiday for girls. For guys, Valentine's Day is just a horrible strike against your manhood, which is going to make you feel miserable for reasons you can't explain, but will have explained to you at length. Um, and I'm trying to think, well, there, there's Memorial Day. Memorial Day is really just a day to have bratwurst to me, because in Wisconsin, Memorial Day is the first day you can really make bratwurst, because the snow has usually thawed by Memorial Day off the grill, so you can go out and open the grill up and put bratwurst on. And then kind of the last day that you really get bratwurst is around Labor Day, which is in September. So you got the whole summer for making bratwurst in Wisconsin. It's, it's the state food, I think. It's, it's delicious. You, you should try some sometime. Um, anyway, this over the holidays, uh, Loretta and I spent some time in Nebraska over the holidays because we were visiting Loretta's family. Because we... We trade off what family we visit every Christmas because that's what God intended or something. And this year, we went to Nebraska to visit Loretta's family. Half, half of Loretta's family lives in Nebraska, approximately, and the other half lives here in California. And I say that knowing that, well, of Loretta's family, two of them, Loretta and her sister, live here. Three of them live in Nebraska, and one of them lives in Colorado. But everyone hates the one who lives in Colorado, so we don't count him. And... The two of us in California, well, there's me, and that, I guess, makes it three, and then there's Maureen's boyfriend, that's four. So it, really, it's, it's pretty close to half California, half in Nebraska. And that actually works out nicely, because some years the people from Nebraska come here, which, which I think for them must be like Catholics visiting the Pope. Because Nebraska at Christmas is miserable. I've just been there. Trust me, do not go to Nebraska for Christmas if you, can, if you don't have to. Because Nebraska is cold, and not really cold, not like upper New York cold, where you know it's going to be way too cold, so you aren't going to go outside at all, like the 
freezing kills people cold. No, Nebraska is just cold enough that when you do go outside, which you do regularly because you've always got to be going somewhere in Nebraska because there's never anything where you actually are. Um, but, you know, you go outside and you've been outside for like two minutes and then you realize you're freezing because there's this wind coming by and it's taking all the heat away from you and you're like, man, is it cold here. And so to warm up, you go inside. And at Loretta's family, inside is rarely warmer than outside. The, the only time that inside was really warmer than outside is when we were visiting Loretta's mother, who's, who's in an assisted living home. And they keep assisted living homes at like 100 degrees, which is great when you've been freezing your behind off in Nebraska for a couple days because you go to visit and it's just really hot there. And it was, it was beautiful, nice and hot. Talk to her mother, sit and read, hot. Just, if, if you gotta be in Nebraska in winter, I guess, visit someone in an assisted living home because it'll be warm there. Um, but anyway, so, so we're in Nebraska, we're visiting your family and there, there are some kind of weird things about visiting family and probably anywhere, but in this case in Nebraska. The first thing is we, we weren't staying in hotels for the most part. You know, we were staying at her brother's house and her sister's house and stuff because because that way it would be nice, you know, we'd be there, we'd stay up late, we'd chat, everything else. But when you're staying in other people's houses, especially people in Loretta's family who, well, her brother is just cheap. And her sister doesn't have a heck of a lot of money because she's getting divorced. And But there are no new buildings in Nebraska near as I can tell. Like, Nebraska built every building they have in about 1940, maybe 1950, and they've just been living in them ever since. So... There, there isn't a place in the in the state that doesn't have wind whistling through all the holes in it or wherever it's got. So it, it's always cold inside. And the layout of the, the places is always kind of weird. Like, you're like, why would they put a room here? You know, normal, progressive, current architecture. You kind of have the concept of, you know, a kitchen and a dining room and a living room and a couple bedrooms and maybe a room for the TV and the surround system. And they kind of had that there, but then they had other rooms that you're like, what possible reason would you have put a room here in the house? You know, it's, it's inside, but it's got glass windows. So when you're in the room, you can't have any privacy because people just stare through the glass windows at you. You're like this, and then they're like, oh, well, that's the parlor. Now, I always, I've heard of parlors. Usually when I read, you know, books by Wuthering Heights or whoever those chick authors from the 1800s are, where they used to have parlors, I'd never actually seen a house with a parlor until I got to Nebraska. Nothing happens in a parlor, really. I mean, no one ever went into the parlor in the house, except for the, the couple days that Loretta's sister and her boyfriend slept in there. And they told me it was a really cold room, which I could believe, because the whole house was cold. And the whole house was cold because it's cold outside, and as, as, is, as heat is wont to do, heat escapes. Anyway, so, so we got to Nebraska, and... I mean, I suppose the, the first interesting thing about the travel was the way we got to Nebraska. I, we had wanted to buy tickets, but we could never quite agree on what dates we were going and everything else. So by the time I looked at buying tickets, you know, I went to all the airline websites, and they had all realized that they were quickly going bankrupt. And so the best thing for them to do would be to raise the prices for all the tickets at Christmas, when they knew people had to buy them, to like a grand a ticket. So they could quick get as much money as they could before they declared bankruptcy. You know, quick give it to the executives, year-end bonuses, that kind of thing. So tickets to Nebraska were like 900 bucks a piece. And I'm like, I'm not spending two grand to fly to Nebraska. It's just going to make me miserable the whole time. I'm going to be going two, two grand to fly to Why am I here? So, so I traded in frequent flyer miles. Now, I have a lot of frequent flyer miles, even though I never fly. And the reason is I got me one of them frequent flyer credit cards, and I just buy everything on the credit card, and I pay it off every month. People, pay off your credit cards every month. Don't leave large balances. Paying interest to credit card companies is dumb, but but getting frequent flyer miles from credit card companies, not quite as dumb. Now, in my case, it's kind of dumb, because it turns out I was never using them. Like, I've been getting them for like seven or eight or nine years and never used a single one. So I thought, well, I'll use some of my frequent flyer miles. So I, I went to the little different tab on the webpage, and I went, well, if I want to buy tickets with frequent flyer miles, what can I do? And they're like, well, there are no frequent flyer seats available on the flights either which I pretty much expected. But then they said, but there are seats available in first class, and you, you could just trade in a couple more miles and you could fly there. And I was like, okay, I've never flown first class. It, it'll be an experience. And experience is what it is to fly in first class. Because, like, 
I view flying as, as like a horrible thing that I have to do every once in a while. I get it, you know, I, usually before I get on a plane, I stay up the whole night before. I take an early morning flight. And my goal is to be so dead tired by the time I get my, my behind into the airplane seat that I can just kind of conk my head over and sleep until we land. Because that, to me, is really the only way you can get through a plane flight. Because you're, you're kind of crowded in like this. And, like, the guy in front of you always leads the seat. I'm not going to go into the whole litany of why air travel sucks. Because everyone talks about it. But air travel sucks. Unless you're in first class. Because when you get into first class, instead of having three seats across, they have two. So you, you kind of sit down in first class. And the first thing you notice is you can shift your hips in both directions. A little bit. Not a huge amount. You maybe like an inch and a half in each direction, but that's, that's really three or four inches more in each direction that your hips can swervel that you can't swervel back in, in coach class or whatever they call it back there, cow class maybe. And the seats, in addition to being wide, you can kind of actually put your feet out and have room without hitting the seat in front. The seats are lovely, and they're leather, which doesn't really do a lot for me, but they were nice seats, so we, why did I get there? And, and there's a whole separate line that you can stand in when you're in first class. It didn't help us this time because we got to San Jose and there was no one in either line. But we still took the first class line because it's the principal, darn it. So we, we got to the front of the first class line because there was no one in it. And then we gave them our tickets and they let us on the plane. And they let us through security. And then we got to the t plane and they let us on. They, you get on first when you're in first class, which is probably why they named it that. See, first class, get on the plane first or you get off the plane first because you're at the front. It's, it's weird. You'd think they'd make first class board last. You know, you'd, you fill up the plane from the back and you empty it from the front. That, that first in, first out kind of computery thing. But that, now, the, the, the space in the seats was kind of nice and Loretta and I sat down and we, we kind of reveled in the space and we kind of went, ah, oh, this is nice. But it wasn't a little while, it wasn't, it was maybe half an hour into the flight when we realized how different traveling in first class is because while you're on the ground, the stewardess comes by and asks you what drinks you'd like. And so I said, you know, I'd like a 7-Up, and right, I got a tomato juice or something. And so, like, 10 minutes into the flight, you know, pretty much just after the plane levels off, the stewardess comes by with your drink, and she sets it down. And then she also set down this little thing, this little white, I'd call it like a little creme brulee cup, except it wasn't a creme brulee cup, because she said, hot nuts. And I didn't quite know what she meant, hot nuts, so I looked down, and the little white cup was, in fact, filled with hot nuts. Who could imagine getting hot nuts on a plane? Like, in the back, you're lucky to get pretzels. Like, they don't give you peanuts in the back. They don't give you nuts in the back. You get, you get pretzels. You get cheesy little stuff. It's First class, hot nuts. They're lovely hot nuts. Let I look at each other and we go, hot nuts. And so we, we try the nut, and it is, in fact, hot. Not too hot delightfully hot. And, and I got the 7-Up. I got the little can of 7-Up. I got the nuts. I'm eating the hot nuts. I'm drinking the 7-Up. I'm thinking, wow, I have never been offered hot nuts on a plane before. And kind of a little bit later, after I finish the hot nuts, and she comes by and takes away the hot nut containers, she comes by and says, hot towels. Hot towels. Little towels that are warm to wash the nut off your hands, I guess. I don't know why they bring you warm towels after hot nuts, but they do. And, and then they come by with little tongs to pick up the towels. It's, it's amazing. You, you can get as many drinks as you want in first class. Like, you can just say, may, may I get a screwdriver? And she says, yes, sir. And then she brings you a screwdriver. And you don't have to give her $5. Like, it's just, it's just included. It's truly an amazing traveling experience. And, and the food in first class... It wasn't good. It was okay. But okay for food on a plane is amazing. Because normally food on a plane is horrible. I, I've had good food on a plane exactly once. When, when I flew back from Microsoft after interviewing there back in 1989. After the snowstorm, I was on the plane and it was kind of late. And the plane was about to push off the gate. And... They announced that they, they hadn't had time to load the regular meals. But they had to go anyway for some reason. And so they said they, they'd quick grabbed some other food or some alternate snacks or something, and that's what everyone was going to get. 
and then at snack time, they, they came down the aisles, and they handed us each a little bag of food, which turned out to be a ham, a, kind of a ham sandwich on a bun, hot, with some cheese, but it was fabulous. I, I don't know how they made it really good, but it was really good. I mean, I, I think in, in retrospect, if I have thought of, if I had really considered it, I don't think I'd eaten it all that day. So I think the reason the food tasted really good that time was because I hadn't eaten in like 24 hours, and so anything would have tasted good. But that was really the only good food I'd ever had on a plane. The first class food, good, not great, good. We flew in first class. We had, we, we, we're, we're going to Nebraska, and as you know, no one flies direct to Nebraska. In fact, if you're in Nebraska and have to fly to somewhere else in Nebraska, you have to fly out of state. Because no one wants to fly directly to Nebraska, so they always route you through somewhere else. We, we were routed through Dallas-Fort Worth. And Dallas, I'm told Dallas-Fort Worth is the airport halfway between Dallas and Fort Worth. So they called it Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. I assume that there was some political struggle within Texas. Is it Dallas-Fort Worth or Fort Worth-Dallas? And it probably went back and forth several times before some committee chairman probably named it Dallas-Fort Worth or something. I notice other cities don't do this. Like, you know, there, there's an airport in Chicago. It's kind of between Chicago and Joliet. But it's not the Chicago-Joliet airport. It's just the Chicago airport. And, you know, the Milwaukee airport, it's between Milwaukee and Whitefish Bay. It's not Milwaukee-Whitefish Bay. It's Milwaukee. Those are the only two I know of. I mean, San Jose airport is pretty much in the middle of San Jose. So it would just be the San Jose airport. San Francisco airport's really in South San Francisco. So it should be the South San Francisco airport. It, I'm, I'm, I'm getting off topic here. So we... We were in Nebraska. We were in Nebraska for a while, visiting various family for various things. <sighs> and it's, it was kind of what it is. It, it again reminded us of why we don't have children, because Loretta's family has a lot of children. And, and by a lot of children, I mean five. And they're all little. Like, I think they're between two and seven. Seven's okay for children. They're, they're kind of curious, but the seven-year-old's well-behaved, so we didn't mind him. But, like, the, the three- and four-year-olds are, are really interesting to deal with. Like, the youngest one doesn't actually know how to talk. He can make noises, but he can't actually speak. But he can kind of speak. So whenever he says anything, you wonder if he's talking or babbling. And he's always babbling. And sometimes well, there was a day that he made noises like a dog. All day long, just little woof, woof, arf, arf noises. And Loretta, you know, was calling him dog and telling him to go things. And he'd do things if you called him a dog. But he wouldn't do things if, you know, just talk to him. And, and, and there's the crying. Apparently little children like to cry a lot. A lot. And when a little child has decided to cry, there's nothing you can do about it. All you can do is hope that the child will decide to not cry in the near future. You, you can try to make the child not cry, but you will fail. And you can try to ignore the child, hoping the child will stop crying. And sometimes that works, and sometimes it doesn't. But in the meantime, you're spending all this effort ignoring a child who's crying. It, it, it was really very difficult with the children. We're, we're happy not to have them. I mean, I'm glad someone has children, because as I've said in the past, someone has to pay more Social Security. And, and that someone is everyone else's children, because... I don't know where else it's coming from. <sighs> Here's another funny thing about Nebraska. See, here, here in California, there's pretty much everything everywhere. Like, if I want to go to a drive-in restaurant, if I want to go to a restaurant and get some food, there are lots of restaurants all over the place that are open that I can go to get food. In Nebraska, like, every town has maybe a couple restaurants, and that's it. Like, there, there's not a variety of restaurants unless you're in a large town. And a large town in Nebraska means Omaha or Lincoln, and we were in neither. We flew into Omaha, and then, of course, we had to drive two and a half hours to the first place we were going. Because everything in Nebraska is at least an hour and a half away from everything else. I mean, it's, I looked up some statistics on Nebraska so I'd sound smart. Nebraska has roughly 500 farms, each of them average of 9,000 acres. And then I tried to do the math in my head about how many farms and how many acres that was. But here's the way to think of Nebraska. Nebraska is really just one big farm, huge farm on which they've sprinkled a couple cities. Because, you know, in, in California, when you're driving from place to place, it's usually pretty suburban for most of the time. Like when I drive from here to San Francisco, I have no concept that I've ever left the city. 
In Nebraska, you can't drive more than 10 miles without hitting a farm. And then it'll be solid farms for the next half hour. And then maybe you'll get to the next city. And the city is like 400 people that have decided to put their houses here because it makes it kind of central between all the farms. It, it's really just, Loretta's sister works in a school district. And by school district, what I mean is building. Mm -hmm. Like, they have one building for the school. Not one building for, like, the, the first to sixth graders. No, it's one building, kindergarten to twelfth grade. And there's one room for each grade. Some years they have 12 people in first grade. Some years they have 20 people in first grade. She said one year they had like four people in first grade. I got to think if you got four people in your first grade class, you're not in an area of the country that you really want to be living. Because what you know is those four people are going to be with you for the next 12 years. And by the end of those 12 years, you're going to hate all of them. And, you know, you're, you're kind of stuck with... You know, in second grade, you can kind of look around. You know who your prom date's going to be. She's either in second grade or first grade. <laughs> you go to prom with a second grader? Yes, it's scary and sad. <sighs> what else? There are 1.75 million people in Nebraska. I think there are 2 million people in the Bay Area. Maybe more. I think there are a million people within half an hour of me. So that, that would be a lot more than 2 million people in the Bay Area. It's just, it's disturbing. Oh, and... And Nebraska had 28,000 people in 1860, which, which was just barely more than the number of people in the city her brother lives in, which had 24,000. He's like, this is a big city. And I'm like, big city? This was your whole state when it was founded. So that was Nebraska. Like I said, it, you know, we go to the city. It, it's Christmas Eve, and Loretta and I and her sister and her sister's boyfriend are driving around. We're trying to get food somewhere. So we, we decided to go get gyros at the gyro place. I don't know why we were thinking gyros in Nebraska. I mean, what are the odds of good gyros in Nebraska? But someone said, yeah, the gyros are actually pretty good. So we drove there. Now, it didn't take us long to drive there because it was, you know, five minutes away. Because everything in the city is five minutes away because the cities aren't big at all. We get there and gyros are closed. We think, well, it's Christmas Eve. You know, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's kind of weird they closed a little early. But, you know, who knows? Maybe they had to go somewhere. So we think, well, let's go somewhere else. We'll go to... Uh, We'll go downtown, we'll find like a bar or something. We get downtown, we get there, and they're like, oh, we're not serving food. So we drive somewhere else, they're closed. I mean, we drove around this little town for like an hour trying to find some place that was open. Eventually, we were forced to eat at McDonald's. I mean, George broke his record. He hadn't eaten at McDonald's in like seven years. We forced George to eat at McDonald's because we were tired of driving, looking for food. Who, who could conceive of a place where there weren't stores open to buy stuff? Like... I have money, please give me food. No, no, they did not want our money. Yeah. Now, while we were gone, I'm watching the news, because they, they did you know, have news in Nebraska. True, it's a day later than everywhere else, but, but I could do it. While I was gone, apparently there was a lot of rain here. Now, I totally missed it. Like, we flew back after the rain, but, but I'm watching the pictures. Now, I didn't totally miss it, because... During all the rain, the, the power went out where I live, and when the power went out, my server went down, and when my server came back up, it didn't restart. So, so I like you know didn't get mail for four days because my server had no electricity, and that that was the the hardship to me because of the rain. But mostly, I'm I'm watching you know Napa, and they're like uh, the river's 14 feet above flood stage, and people are like scooping mud out of places, and then and the more I keep thinking about this, I'm like, you know, the river's a tiny little trough, so I can conceive of how there's a fixed amount of water that can fit in that. But it seems to me the land kind of then slopes away. And you got to get a lot of rain there for the water to start rising up on the land outside the river area that fast. But they're like, you know, there's like four feet of water in downtown. And I keep thinking, how can there be that much water? Why, why doesn't the water just flow down the river to the ocean? And then it occurred to me that, that the water is flowing down the river as quickly as it can towards the ocean. And so I think I've solved this problem. See, the problem is the river only tilts at a slight angle towards the ocean. Our problem really isn't that we've built places too close to rivers. Our problem is that our coasts aren't high enough above the ocean. Like, if, if our coasts were like 10 or 12 feet above the ocean, then the water would flow very quickly. Because, you know, we could just slope it a lot. And the way it would rain, it wouldn't, it, the edges of our country are not high enough. So I'm, 
I think that what we need to do is, rather than, you know, putting those cement rivers in or whatever they do, all we have to do is raise the whole country up a couple of feet. And I think we would solve this whole flooding problem that we have. On another topic, oh, here's something else from Nebraska. I want to mention this. As you can tell, I kind of have a cold. Now, I caught the cold from, from Loretta's sister in Nebraska. And I think I caught the cold because my body's defenses were weak. My body's defenses were weak because I was in Nebraska. And my body knew that I should give up all hope and, and catch a disease or something. It's, it's not the bird flu. People ask me, do you have the bird flu? And I'm like, no, I haven't been near any birds. But, but the whole bird flu thing confuses me anyway because I've never seen a sick bird in my life. Like, birds fly around, and then to me, eventually, they die. And I know birds die because if birds didn't die since birds have babies, we'd just be covered with birds. But I've never seen, like, a bird with a cold. I've never seen a bird sneeze. I've, I don't think I've ever seen a sick bird to save my life. But, but there's this bird flu thing that's apparently going to kill everyone. And, and I was talking earlier today, I was, I was emailing. You know, they were talking about the bird flu in the email. And I said, well, I, I'm kind of looking forward to bird flu. And I'm looking forward to bird flu because my hope is that when bird flu manages to jump, you know, from human to human, what it'll do is it'll kill a bunch of old people. And when it kills a bunch of old people, that'll solve that Social Security and Medicaid thing because all, all the old people will be dead. See, no old people equals no Social Security problem. That'll leave plenty of money in the Social Security system for me when I'm old to sit around my house and shake my cane at kids and talk about this rock music and crap like that. <sighs> Anyway, while we were in Nebraska, since I have the cold, I was forced to go out and buy cold medicine. Now, normally the only cold medicine I buy is, is NyQuil. And, and the NyQuil is great because when you drink the NyQuil, then you sleep like a stone. Like you just get in bed and boom, you're out. And then like 12 hours later, you wake up and you don't have a cold anymore. And that's great. But, but I had to like drive and stuff. So, so I couldn't be drinking the NyQuil. So, so I wanted to buy something for a runny nose. And so we went into a drugstore, and it's like, we want to buy something for everybody knows. And we're looking, and they're like, well, here's for, you know, congestion, here's for something else. And there's, there's really nothing for runny nose. So I go up to the cashier, and I'm like, I want something for a runny nose. And she's like, well, you should probably get, and then she named some drug. I forget what. Now, see, now John's trying to mouth it to me. Just say it, John. Claritin. Claritin. She said Claritin D is what she said. But... <laughs> But I, of course, can't buy name brands, so I, I'm like, they got to have a generic version. So I go back and look, and they, there's none on the shelf, and I'm scanning back and forth, and Loretta goes, it's over here. And then a little further down, they have this place where in, instead of having boxes of medicine, they just have little tags with the names of the medicines. And you have to take the tag back to the pharmacist, and then the pharmacist will give you the medicine. And they have it this way, because Claritin D has pseudoephedrine in it, and pseudoephedrine can be made into meth, crystal meth. You know, it's hillbilly heroin. It's, 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 you know, some really powerful drug that apparently they make in large volumes in Nebraska. And I'd always not known why, but having been to Nebraska recently, now I know why. Because when you're in Nebraska, crystal meth is probably the only thing you can do that will make it interesting. But you, you can't actually buy, you know, anything for a runny nose in Nebraska without going to a, to, to a pharmacist showing your ID and signing something and then I, I did a little research on the, on the net it, you know lots of states have passed these rules California actually you know you, you, they will only let you buy like two boxes of it or something Minnesota I, I think has gone great Minnesota lets you buy 21 days worth of cold medicine a month so you got to time your colds correctly like you know if you got a cold that's going to last a month you got to pick which seven days you don't take the cold medicine because you're not allowed to have more than three weeks of cold medicine in a month it's it's wacky. Anyway, I think that, that's it for this week. I, I had more stuff, and I, I was terribly afraid I'd run out of stuff to talk about tonight. But, but as always, I've gotten to like half of it. So I've got to put the other half into my list of stuff for next show. And, and I guess I'll see you then. <laughs>